your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. <laughs> Some of you thought that was God. Forget about the announcements. And please take the time, uh, if you haven't, go to gctyorkville.net. It is a splendid website. Um, uh, please take the time. Information. And Facebook page. There's a Facebook page now, man. Hi, Jackie. Everyone turn around to the camera and say, hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. So Jackie Hindi is home watching this service live. And that doesn't mean that you stay home. <laughs> the first time I catch someone or hear about someone staying home, I will see to it between Thomas and Jeff Mix. And Andrew, I will put all the geek minds together as possible. And when you log on, they're going to send a virus to your computer and flush it. Boom. Gone. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Just thank, just thank the Lord for that. Thank you. Amen. Amen. This is part three in this sermon, Stephen's sermon that's recorded in largely uh, Acts chapter 7. I want to read, as I said last week, I want to focus on now this section where he comes nearly to the end of his sermon and indicts this Sanhedrin council, these religious Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, indicts them with his incredibly strong words and what this has to say for us. So I want to read the text from verses 44 through 53, just that section alone. Give thanks to the Lord. I want to speak to you before we further go into this and into this text. Acts chapter 7, verse 44. Stephen says, Our fathers had a tent of witness in the wilderness just as he spoke to Moses who spoke to Moses, directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nation that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build? Received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And then verse 54 is where we know, and we're going to actually say verse 54 through the end of verse 60 until next week, and then finish it up. When they heard these things, um, they became so enraged what he said and what these words clearly meant and what they implied that uh, they stopped his sermon because it really looked like that. He looks like Stephen couldn't even finish the sermon. They stopped his sermon and uh, they're going to take him out of the sermon and that's what they're going to do. I want to focus on primarily verse 51 today and show you why again for the third week in a row why this is a great sermon uh, from Stephen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, now for a few minutes, uh, if you don't touch hearts to receive your word, then our hearts will remain hostile and indifferent until the passage of Scripture is over. And what a great Savior we have in this God of heaven and heaven to know that he's sitting here with us now and to know who you are and who you are. What a Savior we have. What a Savior we have. And now, Lord, we ask your strengthening as I take time for a few minutes. And also, if you 
you're someone who this morning has just not had their heart touched. Lord, make this the last day that they remain hardened and stiff-necked before the truth. In your name we pray. This verse 51 has been an intriguing verse for me uh, for many, many years for a variety of reasons, but I want to nail it down and boil it down to two things about this verse. Uh, This portion of the sermon tells us what is man's need, and it tells us what is the answer to man's need. Man's problem, as Stephen understands Scripture, being led of the Holy Spirit, and Luke is recording this for us, man's problem is that his heart is encased and is hardened up in sinful rebellion against the truth. And it has no power to break free on its own. And it has no desire to do so in turning to Christ. That's the problem with the heart. The answer to that problem, to man's dilemma, is that God must decisively act on behalf of a sinner, cutting the heart, so that it may respond to the truth with repentance and be saved. This explains, if you're here this morning and you love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as best as you understand what is the gospel that Jesus Christ, what he did for you on the cross, and that by faith in Jesus Christ, his his perfection, his righteousness is transferred to you. If that's you here this morning, this text will actually help you understand why you're saved and others aren't. At the end of the day, I've always wanted to know scripturally, why is it that I am saved? And so many of my cousins, back in West Virginia, who heard the same gospel, they heard it from my dad for years. They heard it from their father for years. They heard, And other cousins heard it from their father, Bud Truman, Ronnie Truman, and Bobby Truman. And then their grandpa, Grandpa Sears. Why is it that my eyes and my ears are open to this day to so many who heard the same gospel? I can't assure you. Am I smarter? <laughs> you know that. I play, I play a banjo. <laughs> it's not because I'm smarter. That can't be the case. And second, you would have a greater fear, and I mean in a respectful way as the Bible teaches, and a reverence, and a a trust, a joyful trust uh, in the Lord for his continued work in your own heart as he continues to cut away sin. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to do a little bit of homework because Stephen is invoking something out of the Old Testament. And we haven't been doing a lot of work in the Old Testament. Uh, That's why Martin Lloyd-Jones preached 36 sermons from chapter 7 alone. Amen. You're only getting four. It was three. Um, I know we can get out here with four. It's so packed with the Old Testament. So we need to do just a little bit of homework in the Old Testament to follow this, this language of what does it mean to be uncircumcised in heart and ears. So let's go back to Moses. They've accused Stephen that you botched Moses. Well, let's go to Moses. Turn with me. Two passages in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 10. First, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. And then we're going to look at one other passage in Deuteronomy. Keep in mind, Moses is old. He's about ready to die Deuteronomy is, is, is a sequel, actually, to the book of Exodus. He's saying a lot of the same things, but a whole generation has gone by and died in the wilderness. And now he's about to die, and Joshua and Caleb will take over. And here's what he says to this up-and-coming generation that will go into the land of promise. Deuteronomy chapter 10, would you look at verse 16? It says this, 
circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. Stop. God is saying through Moses, the prophet, for his own people, you circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Just to uh, gently and lightly say that the foreskin would be cut off, going all the way back to Abraham, would be cut off, and that would be a sign to not only to yourself, but to everyone else and to God that you are taking seriously sin in the heart. It's no different. Only believers are to do this in worship. Physical, God has attached the physical world to teach spiritual truth. <coughs> Get me a drink of bread. They talk at the same time. I love teaching in the morning. Eat, drink, drink. And this would be a sign, and here Moses is telling them, you do that. So I, I at least get this, and this principle has to do with salvation. Salvation has to do with a circumcision of the heart. That's what salvation is. And God is saying through Moses, you do it. Wow. I got to circumcise my own heart. That's what needs to be done. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 30. The Sanhedrin court that Stephen is sharing the gospel with, they know this, they know these passages. They just don't see them correctly, which he will say. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Now God says through Moses to the same people, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. There's coming a day in the future as Moses is a prophet. He's seeing into the future and he's saying truthful things at the same time. That what really needs to take place is that God will circumcise the heart. And if God does that, then the heart will be free to love and obey. Otherwise, it's not free to love and obey. Because it's too in love with its sin. So you can say it like this. Deuteronomy chapter 10, it's all about circumcision. It's a picture of salvation. You belong to God, and it says you do it. But Deuteronomy, the Father draws him to himself. But you must believe. But you can't. Scripture's filled with paradoxes like this of what you must do, but you can't do it unless God gives it to you. It's not God's fault that he's holy, and then he says to all of mankind, everyone be perfect as I am perfect or you'll die. The soul that sins must die. That's not God's fault. God is holy. He's not going to lower his standard and accommodate me or you. So he can lay down the law, so to speak, and say, here's the standard and I'm not budging. You must repent. You must believe. You must circumcise your heart. You must do all this because I'm holy. And yet at the same time, it blows us away because we're not capable of doing what God commands. It's the paradox of Scripture, and no less here. Both Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 uses language like this regarding the uncircumcised heart. Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant, cutting the heart of stone out and replace it with a heart of flesh, and if God does that, he says, then I will write my laws on your heart that you may love the Lord your God and walk in his ways. I got to give you a new heart. You can't do it on yourself. In fact, you don't even know that you need one. And if, and if you did know you needed one, you wouldn't want it because you love your sin so much. So I'm, I've got to do for you what needs to be done. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel use the language that the problem with Israel, the problem with mankind, just as Stephen saw it, is that they have an uncircumcised heart. In both Jeremiah 6.10, Jeremiah 9.26, and Ezekiel 44, verse 7 and 9, 
both Jeremiah and Ezekiel say, quote, you have an uncircumcised in heart and ears. Or rather, you are uncircumcised in heart and ears. And that's the reason, that's the explanation for the hostility toward God. They're not saved. They're identified as God's people ethnically, nationally, patriotically, geographically, but they're not truly saved in heart. And that was always the explanation as to why Israel goes astray, goes astray, goes astray, goes astray. Remember in Acts chapter 2 as we come back to the book of Acts. Remember what Peter quoted in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost? He quoted Joel and, and it's that section from Joel chapter 2 where Peter says, quoting Joel, the prophet, there's coming a time when God says, I will pour out my spirit on, remember what it says? All flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then the next verse down, God reminds his people as Peter preaches, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Context, meaning speak the truth of God. They'll be on God's side. They'll be on for God's side. Because God will so pour out his spirit on all flesh, that clearly can't mean everyone without exception. It's got to be everyone without distinction. That's the point of Pentecost because people were coming from all over the world, all kinds. But look with me at Acts chapter 2. After Peter says that, and we're being reminded of it in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and that pouring out is a kind that produces speaking truthful things about God. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41, I want to put you into remembrance of what we already read that actually help, is very helpful for some understanding of what Stephen said. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made far, far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And that is a calling that is not merely external, it's inward. It's what God does before the foundation of the world, as Scripture teaches in many other places. And Peter wraps that section up. 3,000 souls were saved. I want you to notice what happened here. Uh, the gospel is given, but they were cut to the heart. They say, in response to being cut to the heart, what do we do? And Peter says, you've got to repent. And clearly, repentance took place because Luke adds in verse 47, that, or verse 41, that 3,000 souls were saved. And so notice the order. Actually, it is God who calls because the promise is for all who, that God calls. The calling on the inner man has got to be there first. And then God cuts the heart. And then you're capable of repenting. You will repent because he pours out his spirit on all flesh and they will prophesy, those that I do this to. And God saves his called. This is repentance that leads to salvation. It all began with being called and then, it, then you got cut on your heart. We see this order in one, two other places that I want to show in the book of Acts, and then we can go right back to verse 51, and I want to show you what we walk away with today. Look at Acts chapter 13. The apostle Paul has about had it up to here with Israel, with Jews rejecting the gospel, though they are still trickling, they're coming in. There are Jews being saved, but the gospel is going to the Gentiles. And they just got back from a time where many Gentiles uh, came to know the Lord. And, and chapter 13, verse 44, picks it up. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside. And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. 
For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And verse 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life, that's language of calling, that has to do with election, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. In other words, the believing is the result of being appointed to eternal life. Otherwise, you can't believe. And otherwise, you can't repent unless God calls and cuts the heart and takes out the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. Chapter 18 is one more piece of evidence, and then we'll, we'll wrap our time up looking at verse 51. Chapter 18 uh, Paul is in Corinth, and there is a threat to his physical well-being. It's very possible he's going to get stoned or flogged or whipped. We're not really sure. But he's thinking about leaving. He just doesn't want to stay there in Corinth. And Jesus comes to him in a post-resurrection appearance, in fact, post-ascension appearance. Jesus comes to him, Acts chapter 18, verse 9, and assures him, to stay there and gives him a reason to stay there. And he says this, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. Keep on sharing the gospel. Why? For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. Why is that? For I have many in this city who are my people. And that's the language that the Bible uses to describe even as far back as Jesus' birth, Matthew 121. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, Jesus has a people. My sheep hear my voice, and I know my sheep. My Father has given them all to me, and I'll not lose any of them. This is, this is ownership language. Jesus says to Paul, stay here. It'll be okay. Why? Because I have many people. They belong to me, so I want you to stay. The cutting upon the heart, there will be no spiritual awakening in the heart. I have witnessed to people all my life. My dad taught me how to be an evangelist. I love evangelizing lost, and I have seen people under conviction. I can see it on their face. They are agitated. They are sweating. They are, they are excusing. They are dodging the gospel, and all they want to do is run, and they're getting very angry, and they're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they are hostile to the truth. But there will be no awakening unless there is a cutting first. Because it's the cutting that leads to, what must I do to be saved? Second, Stephen says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always, how many have an English translation that uses always? Raise your hand. You've got a good one. Because it really is there in the Greek. And I think it's in every single English translation. Always. Uh, how many of you have um, husband and wife arguments like Cheryl and I do? And I'll say, Cheryl, you always. And Cheryl says, you always put your shoes in the doorway and never. You know, I did do about five years ago. I did it twice. You can't. You know, that word always is dangerous language. Uh, in marital uh, reconciliation. And uh, you cannot use that word in an absolute sense, but here Stephen does. Always is absolute in this sentence. The term stiff-necked was a term that was invoked in Exodus chapter 32 and 33 by Moses, and he used that same term, stiff-necked, to describe Israel's worship of the golden calf. And it is the religion of self-invention. An uncircumcised heart can't do anything other than resist. It always will resist. Why? Because it's uncircumcised. It freely resists the Holy Spirit, but it is not free to obey. It is in bondage. It is encased. It is enslaved to its stubbornness against the Holy Spirit. And it is God who must cut the sinfulness out of the heart first. Then the heart will gladly Say, what must I do to be saved? And then cut. The heart.
heart is in opposition to the gospel. It is hostile to the truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 7, I'll invoke one passage outside of this. Paul reminded the Romans and he reminds us this morning, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. That's what Paul says. It can't. It must or it'll die. But it, the problem, it can't. Yeah, you can take that paradox up with God one day, but there'll be no excuse for being judged this way. And I'm going to help you see that in just a minute. Point number three. Keeping the law, according to Stephen, is turning to the righteous one, who is Jesus Christ crucified, for salvation. He says right here at the end of... Um, Verse 53, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. This is so beautiful. This is worth three sermons on its own. I, I can I just start writing and writing and writing. Oh, my goodness, what verse 53 means. Stephen puts it all together so beautifully. Stephen invokes the law, but the point of the law was not to save. It was to drive you to the righteous one whom you crucified. So when you read Moses, you don't read it rightly. And therefore, you don't keep it because if you kept the law, you would see that the law is to drive you to your knees and cry out for mercy because you know that you can't keep the law. And that's the law's purpose, is to put such an impossible expectation upon your heart that you just think, I can't do it. I need to be saved golden calf at the at the foot of Mount Sinai. That's why right now some of you could be worshiping a golden calf in God's sight right now. That's serious stuff. Well, we need good news, don't we? Here it comes. Number four. For your heart and mind. Question. Ivan, how do I know that I am just using the words that are found in, in Luke's sequel to his gospel, found in Acts alone. How do I know that I am called, that's true, a recipient of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that's true, ordained to eternal life, chapter 13 of Acts, and part of the I have many people who belong to Jesus, Acts chapter 18. How do I know? And the answer is this, and it's really simple. Does your neck move easily to Christ most of the time? Or is it just stiff through and through? Or is it like you want to just call it out? And I say most of the time simply because I'm still fighting the blow. And you can answer it like this. How do you know? You repent of known sin. How do you know? You want to know Jesus more and more through his word. How do you know? You want to be with others who know Jesus through his word. How do you know? You see more and more of Jesus and less and less of yourself. Jesus is your Lord and master. Jesus is your Lord and master. And at the heart of the gospel lies the truth that we cannot save ourselves. Do you acknowledge that? You can't. Have you, I ask you this morning, have you rightly read the scriptures and seen what perfect righteousness God requires and then respond accordingly? Now, how do I respond accordingly? It's very simple. Do you plead with the words that are found in that old hymn, Rock of Ages, but for me? Do you say, wash me, Savior, or I die? you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe you're even wondering right now, hey, Ivan, can I be saved? And here's my response. I don't know. What, do you want to be saved? That's my next question. Do you want to be saved? Do you see your great need? If you do, you know what Jesus says, come. All who come to him. Do you 
to you now. And as we close for our own church family, further into our hearts and minds, have you become so accustomed to the truth of God's word that it no longer speaks to your heart and your affections? I don't want to be a stiff-necked piece of paper. I don't want that. Have you become cynical about what the word of God says about you and your need to be changed in Christ? We, we go along in this Christian life and we can feel the stiff neck turn back and the stiff neck sin, the fight against sin, and we are rebellious and hostile to the truth. Lord, help me. And I know you've given me your spirit and I know you've given me all the grace that I need. Are you more concerned? Am I more concerned about looking like a Christian on the outward than believing and reforming like a Christian on the inward? Have I turned Sunday morning worship into an idol like the golden calf? Worship by the Lord. I don't want that to happen. I don't think you want that to happen. I think you want to come here because you love Jesus. And you love his word. And you want to be with other people who love Jesus and his love. And you know in your own heart you are always on the receiving end. That God must do what is required of me. Wash me, save me, and I die for you.